Oh, yeah. We are back. Last week was Easter. It was a fast week for me. I don't know how you guys, your week went. Mine was fast. I was pumped. I came back on Tuesday, rested, ready to go, and I pulled up the document on my computer where all of your questions to this new series we're starting called You Asked For It. All your answers compile in. I can't see where they came from or who gave them to me or anything like that, but there they were. There's all these questions, and I'm going to tell you, you didn't, you didn't take it easy on me. Like, you asked some really hard questions. I was, like, hoping for some softball questions, and no. Y'all just were mean about it and punished me, and so uh, this whole week I've been thinking and praying for you, uh, praying more for myself, though, because I had to answer your questions. Let me say this, though, before we get into that. Let me say this. Last week, I was so pumped because we did this special Easter giving. Remember, we called it Easter 19. You could text Easter 19 to this phone number. In fact, I think we might be able to still throw it up there if you want to give. But you gave for, uh, it was a little thing we called Care for the Caregiver, and we're partnering with Prevail of Central Indiana, and they provide care for victims of crime and abuse, um, all kinds of things, and they provide therapists and advocates and all kinds of support and help. And what we found was that the burnout, we found out that the burnout rate for the caregiver in these types of situations is really high. And so um, we asked if we could just bless that organization and uh, bless the caregiver. And so we uh, brought our resources, finances together so that we could just give that gift to them. If you still want to give, you can still do that. Text Easter 19 to that phone number there. It's very simple. You give a dollar or a billion dollars, whatever you want to give. But give, and, um, and then over the next couple of weeks, we're going to uh, invite Prevail here. We're going to honor them, thank them for all that they're doing, and then give them that gift. Does that sound good? <laughs> if you're watching online, let me just say hi to you real quick. We're so glad that you're joining with us. We know that you, uh, uh, you couldn't make it, but we're glad that you're live with us on Facebook. We hope that you have a warm cup of coffee and that you meet some friends on here and that you'll join us again live some other time, but also right here in the room. Right, everybody? It's fun here, right? Yeah. Yeah. We got donuts this morning, right? Yeah. Like, we know. We know how it is. We know how it is. We're like, okay, we know they're going to come on Easter, right? Like, if you don't come to Easter, you're going to hell, right? So you got to come on Easter, <laughs> right? So then we entice you with donuts to get you back. We're so pumped that you are here. And uh, I'm excited about this new series again. Let me jump back into that. This new series, it's going to be fantastic, but you asked some really hard questions. Um, uh, I'm not a handyman. Let me just say that. I'm not a handyman. When I do better at breaking things around the house than I do fixing things. I don't know about how you are. Maybe you have uh, wrenches and a hammer and you know how to use them. I have wrenches and a hammer and they just kind of sit there and I, uh, I never really look at them. But Whenever something starts leaking or something breaks in my house, I maybe am like you in that I go to YouTube. Anybody else, you just pull up YouTube, like, why is this leaking? How do I make it stop, right? So I'm watching YouTube videos. I do that all the time to fix all kinds of things in my house. Just, like, nowadays, I'm not even thinking anymore. I just go to YouTube. Like, that's just, like, why are we thinking on our own? We should just, you know, group think. So we go to YouTube, and I can learn it. But this week, I've gotten myself into something that is so confusing and so not in my world, and I don't understand it, but I got to understand it, okay? So I have a lot of questions. Here's what I find. When you have a lot of questions or confusion about something, it creates obstacles and distractions from you pursuing and getting what you really want, okay? It, that's what kind of questions and confusion does. So my son, Dean, uh, has Pokemon cards. Anybody... Pokemon cards. Uh, I, I didn't know this world, okay? I, I, I'm into it now, and I've been watching hours uh, of YouTube videos on Pokemon because Dean has Pokemon cards, and he, people have given him Pokemon cards because when they find out that he likes them, they just, like, give them his collection, their collection. And so I don't know what these things mean. Like, he's like, Dad, can you show me how to play Pokemon? I have no idea how to play Pokemon. I barely can pronounce the word, okay? So I'm, I'm looking at the Pokemon cards. I'm trying to figure it out, and I can't figure it out, so I get on YouTube. And I've been watching, since Tuesday, YouTube videos about Pokemon, okay? A lot, a lot of videos, and I just have stepped into a world of 12 and 13-year-olds that I didn't know existed, okay? And so I'm in this new subculture that I had no idea about Pokemon, and I'm watching 12 and 13-year-olds on the internet play Pokemon. I feel 
really weird doing that. I don't know how you would feel, but I'm, I'm there trying to learn what Pokemon is. And I, I'm putting the pieces together. I'm like, okay, so there's an active Pokemon. There's a bench. There, I'm learning. I'm prize cards, right? There's a, there's a, a pack, a, a, a stack of cards you can draw from. And, and there's energy cards. And there's, and there's trainer cards. And sometimes there's a supporter card, but that confuses me. And each Pokemon needs an energy so that they can attack or so they can retreat. And if you don't have that, you have to go get, I don't know about, I've made it this far. And it's so confusing. It is so confusing. And I have so many questions. And I don't know where to go to find some straight answers. Like, okay, how do you, what's the point? What's the point of this game, right? Is there money? Should I be putting money on the table, right? Am I going to lose money? I just need to know that right now. And so I get into Pokemon. Anybody into Pokemon? Anybody know how to play Pokemon? Great. Okay, we need to talk. So um, we need to talk. Uh, but yesterday I sat Dean down. I said, Dean, I think I figured out Pokemon. And he goes, what? I go, yeah, I, I have been researching uh, because I'm an awesome dad. And uh, I've been researching how to play Pokemon so that I could play with you. And so I'm going to teach you how to play Pokemon because he's been asking, how do you play Pokemon? So we sat down and I showed him how to put the bench and, and the active Pokemon and, and the prize cards. And, and I'm just, be honest with you, I'm just impressed I know this much so far, okay? And so I get it all set up. And I say to him, okay, uh, Dean, and so you got to draw, and so we draw cards, and, we're, and I'm trying to explain what each card means, and, and then there's this symbol on the card that I don't know what it means, and, 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 and all the videos of these 12 and 13-year-olds who, like, just play it, like, they just know it, right? Like it's, just, it's like a second, like a language I don't even understand. They're like, if you read the card, it will tell you what to do in the game. Okay, okay so I'm trying to read the card, but it's saying things I don't know. Flip a coin? What? Where's the coin at? And now the money, you know, and so I'm confused, and anyhow... I get all set up for Dean, I'm try and I don't know what this symbol means. I'm like, man, I got to YouTube that, Dean. I don't know what that means. And Dean goes, well, Dad, you want me, you want me to get the instructions? I'm like, what? <laughs> you, got you got instructions for this? Give me the instructions. So he gets it out of his desk. He's like tucked in there, you know. He can't. I'm like, what? It's this big old piece of paper. It's got lines and stuff. How long have you had this, right? And then I look at it, and I realize, I've done a pretty good job so far. I, I figured it out this far, and like, okay, I got the deck, all right, that's it, you know. And, and then I start explaining what the symbols are. Okay, all right, all right. And so luckily, I had the instructions because it answered all these questions in my mind. Now, this week, I'm going to be back to studying Pokemon again, so if anybody wants to help me. But I, I want to share this with Dean because, honestly, as I got into Pokemon, I was like, I can see how people have fun playing this, right? And so I want Dean to know Pokemon. He's got all these Pokemon cards. He's got tons of Pokemon cards and how to create a deck and all this kind of stuff. Here's what I find, though. I find that there's a lot of people who get into life. I don't know where it got confusing for you, where it started to get painful for you. I don't know what started to hurt you in your life or the stories you got or the experiences you have or or the kind of personality you have, or maybe you've gotten into something, you're like, I'm not good at that, I am good at that, what am I supposed to do with that, I hate that, love that, all these different passions that you have, and don't we get to a place in life where you're like, I got a lot of questions, and then you throw God into the mix, right, this God that you can't hear, see, talk to, look at, you know what I mean, all these things that you're going, okay, so you're throwing God in here, and then someone throws this at you, and it's got numbers, big numbers, little numbers. It's got all these books, but yet it is one book, and it's Old Testament, New Testament. Like, you're like, what? And how do we put all this together? So as I got into your questions, I kind of felt like I did when I started with Pokemon. Like, I could kind of resonate with some of the questions in there. Like, yeah, that really doesn't make a lot of sense. Now, here's the good news. I'm not the first to be very confused by Pokemon. And you're not the first to be very confused about God. But what you need, like I need, is a little bit of instructions. Maybe, maybe we'll get to heaven someday, and they'll be like, God, that life thing was really weird. Like, what was that, right? And he'll be like, well, did you, uh, did you get the instructions? And be like, what? I, I downloaded the Bible. I'm, I didn't know that was something I had to read, right? What we're going to do is to really know who God is. He revealed himself through his word. Now, this last series, this teaching series we just got done with was called When Pigs Fly. We looked at all the miracles 
in the Bible and say, okay, what does it say about who God is and how do we experience those miracles in our own life? I absolutely loved it. I loved it because we, we took a book in the Bible called John. It was the Gospel of John. Now, now I got, I'm going to tell you a little bit about John because that was part of what he wrote. But he also wrote these other books called First, they just, we just, we're really good at naming books of the Bible. First John, Second John, Third John, okay? First John, Second John, Third John. It's at the end of the Bible, and there's these three documents or these three letters that John wrote to you and I, uh, and it tells us some straight answers to some really difficult questions. And as I read First John, Second John, Third John, I am finding that the same questions that y'all and I have today are the same questions he was answering 2,000 years ago. So we're going to keep with the author, John. We just got done reading the, the gospel of John, the eyewitness account of John. Now we're going to read 1 John, 2 John, 3 John over the next five weeks. They're very short documents, very short writings that he gives. And I'm going to give some background on those. But to start us off, to kick us off, let's read the Bible together. We're going to be in uh, 1 John chapter 1, and we're just going to read the first four verses. Now, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John are some deep books, and, and they're rich. And so uh, we're just going to look at a couple verses just to get us started. This is just to get us going this morning. So 1 John 1, verse 1 says, We proclaim to you the one who existed from the beginning, whom we have heard and seen. We saw him with our own eyes and touched him with our own hands. He is the word of life. And this one who is life itself was revealed to us. We have seen him, and now we testify and proclaim to you that he is the one who is eternal life. He was with the Father, and then he was revealed to us. And we proclaim, proclaim to you what we ourselves have actually seen and heard so that you may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that you may be Full, so that you may fully share our joy. So right at the very beginning, John just kind of jumps right into it. Let me tell you something about John. He writes this. He says, we proclaim this. Let me tell you about who he is. John is the author, and John is writing this. Uh, some background on John is this. John uh, grew up a fisherman in a fisherman's family, all right? Now, I just kind of go back with me and just kind of think fishermen for a minute, right? Like, they're out on the water, they're fishing, and so they're kind of a loud family. You know, he grew up Jewish, he, so, so there's a lot of this Jewish heritage that he has in his background, and it shows up a lot in what he writes, but, but what he talks, he's just kind of a straight shooter. Like, he's just very opinionated. He's just gonna tell you how it is. He doesn't beat around the bush, he is kind of artistic in that he likes to show kind of word images of things, but maybe that's because he was illiterate. Maybe that's because he didn't know how to write, so he's dictating this stuff. It's, it's, he's like, like, it's like this. It's like that, and he's just kind of outlining this. But he is a fisherman, and fishermen have a way about themselves. If John were to walk in here today, a lot of theologians believe that he would just kind of be like this big, burly guy who'd just kind of give you a big old bear hug if he liked you, and if he didn't like you, he'd tell you why. And he's just kind of an honest-to-goodness dude, right? He's just a, just a dude who's just going to tell you what he thinks. He is outspoken. Him and his brother James had nicknames, Sons of Thunder. I don't know how you earn that kind of nickname, but you got to be loud to earn that kind of nickname. you got to kind of be passionate. Like, he had a big heart. We can see in his writing, he really captures the passion and the, and the, the empathy of Jesus. So John is such a loud mouth about the gospel. After Jesus rose from the dead, he was one of the 12 apostles that followed Jesus. And when he writes the gospel of John, the eyewitness account of this is what Jesus did. Here's what we saw. Here's what we heard. Here's who Jesus was. You didn't get to see him. We did. Here's what happened. And he shares all of that. He describes himself in the gospel as the one Jesus loved, right? Like, I just like that attitude. Like, yeah, he had all these other jokers, but seriously, he really liked me the best. It was kind of obvious, right? And, and John shares in his eyewitness account, look, I was there when he did that miracle. I was there when he raised Lazarus from the dead. And John says, I was right there, watched him die on a cross. I watched my, the person I was trusting and following with my life die. 
And I was one of the very first people to show up at that tomb and see the stone rolled away and put my head inside and look and see nothing in there. And then I was one of the very few, very first people to ever see Jesus alive, holes in the wrists, in the feet. I saw it with my two eyes. He says, I'm sharing with you an eyewitness account. Here's why he's sharing it. Because he, after Jesus rose from the dead, he went to Ephesus. He immersed himself in the Greek culture. I think he kind of probably felt good in the Greek, you know, just loud, boisterous, you know what I mean, opinion, everybody's sharing their thing. And he lived there in the city of Ephesus, big, booming town, very, not really Jewish, but he could just be himself a Christian. He was labeled a Christian in the church of Ephesus. This is the, this Christian guy named John, meaning that he trusted and followed Jesus with his life. He believed in Jesus. And so he's this Christian. He's telling everybody in Ephesus about Jesus. The Romans at the time have martyred, have murdered all the 12 disciples, the 12 apostles that followed Jesus. John is the last man standing. He's the youngest. He's the last man standing. Now, as they've martyred all these apostles, they're realizing it's not slowing the church down. And more people are converting and following Jesus Christ with their life. So what do they do with John? They don't know what to do with John. John's boisterous. John, John's outspoken. John is telling everybody about Jesus. He's a leader. And so what they do is, well, we can't kill the guy. So they remove, they remove, this is how you know you're a son of thunder. They remove him from society and put him on an island by himself. Like they just try to isolate him, right? That's how you know you're doing your job right. We just got to get you away from people because every time you're around people, they all want to follow Jesus with their life. So they isolate him. Now, he gets on this island where he's in prison on this island. No one can get to him, but he converts to jail. Like everybody there is becoming Christian. And he's able, from this island, he knows he's going to die here. He knows he's not going to get out here. And so from this prison, he sees all these, he hears all these stories about who Jesus is. And there's some really weird beliefs out there. All these crazy things about Jesus that aren't even really true. And John's like, that's not, what? where did you hear that? I can imagine his frustration. Like, where did you hear that? Who's saying that? So John sits down and he says, I've got to tell people my account. My, I saw these things. And so he writes his story, which is where we get the good news of John, the gospel of John, the book of John. And he writes his eyewitness account of who Jesus was, who he is today, how he's alive, how he lived, how he's an example to us, and the things that he taught. He shares all of these things in the Gospel of John. He sends that out. That document gets sent out, and churches are reading it and sharing it, copying it down, writing it to other people. He's also there on this island, and he hears all these weird beliefs about Jesus. Not only this weird, like Jesus didn't do, but Jesus didn't even think that way. Like, that's not what Jesus talks about. And so he hears all these weird beliefs, and he says, I've got to i got to answer these questions that our culture is having. So he writes these little tiny documents, which we call 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, that all go together. They're called epistles. They're letters. that They're basically like Hail Marys to the future church, to you and I. This is what we believe. This is why we believe it. In response to the confusing culture that people are living in. Now, as you study history... And I love, love history. As you study history, you study humanity, you're going to realize that the same questions that John is answering are the questions that we have today. Let me give you an, an idea of the question that John answers in his epistle. He, write, he, he, he writes the answer to the question, just a straight answer. I love it. He says, what are the clear marks of a real Christian? Like, what does a real Christian look like? Or how do we know what's right, what's wrong, according to God, and not according to just anybody's whim or culture? Uh, can Christians still sin in word, deed, or thought and still be a Christian? That's a question he answers. Another question is, how do we love people we don't even like? which is an honest to goodness question. I like that one. And here's another question. Is a pure life even possible in this world? Another question he answers is, what happens when we die? Is hell or heaven even real? And these are just a few of the questions that the epistle of John makes really clear, concise answers to. And so as I read your questions, I was also like amazed at how how unique and how interesting they were and how they compared to the culture that I know that John wrote from. So like I said, John grew up in or lived in Ephesus and he, and he did ministry in Ephesus. 
And in Ephesus, in Greek culture, which is still very prominent today, there's this idea of Gnosticism. Now, you may never have heard that word, but when I read the, the, the beliefs, the kind, of the kind of the underlying beliefs that Gnosticism is, you're going to say, man, that sounds like today's culture. Let me read to you a little bit of this weird teaching, this weird belief, this Gnosticism kind of thing. Um, one is God is distinct, and God is, let me start over, God is distant, and not really relevant to the ideas, actions, or belief that shape my daily life today. Another Gnostic belief is that Jesus was a really good guy, that God used to do some really good stuff, but he's not really relevant to today. Or this one is, is kind of new, kind of this elitism, kind of celebrity status, and uh, it's kind of this idea that like Jesus, if you're a good person who does good things, you're better than most people. You're better than other people. And it's that kind of that idea, like, I'm a good person. Well, how do you know? Well, look at that dude or look at that lady. I, I'm better than they are, right? So I must be doing something pretty good. Another b- Gnostic belief is that only the special and select have really any value in life, a.k.a. how many likes, how many followers, how many subscribers. And I watch YouTube kids with my kids, and they're like, hey, if you like this video, like it and subscribe on the bottom, Right. I'm like, okay, all right, but they're growing up in that culture. Like, if it really, if this is any value, if what I've created is any value, it's only going to be determined by how many views I get, how many likes I get, how many values, how many followers, subscribers, all that kind of stuff. Another idea of Gnosticism is God is not real because a good God would not let a world be so bad. Now, here's another idea of Gnosticism, and this was, for me, was really prevalent in the, uh, in a lot of movements recently, was Evil cannot harm me, meaning if I keep my private life hidden and make sure my public life looks perfect, I'm doing okay. I'm doing okay. And then the last idea of Gnosticism is really my sin is not a problem. It's not what's plaguing me. It's not what's holding me back. It's not my problem. And what John writes is, here is we proclaim to you. And, and he's answering, look, look, this, we have stood shoulder to shoulder with Jesus. John is saying, I have stood eyeball to eyeball with this guy. And I will tell you, Jesus is the word of life. That's what John writes. He said he's the word of life. In other words, John says in the Greek term, he's the logos, meaning this. John's looking at all this culture and says, Jesus is the word of life. This word idea in Greek culture was that words create worlds. I say that all the time. Worlds, words create worlds worlds. I could say something negative to you, and you will hold on to that negative statement all week long. I could say something positive to you, and you'll forget it by the end of the day. How is that possible? Because words are powerful, and they create bridges, and they create paths for people. And when you give someone a straight answer and answer their question, when you give someone a straight answer, you're giving them a pathway. You're opening doors for them, right? Words are powerful. And John says he is the logos. He is the word of life, meaning He is the beginning. He is the bridge to everything that you're pursuing in your life. You want a good marriage? You want good finances? You want a good career? You want good kids? You want good health? You want good success in a significant life? He is the word, meaning he is the bridge to get there. There's no other way of getting there. And the reason I love this, the reason why John writes this is because he's looking at his culture. And in this culture, It's not monotheistic. We live in a monotheistic idea world. Monotheistic means that there's one God. We believe that as Christians. There's one God, and his name is Jesus Christ, and we can trust and follow him with our entire lives. He's the answer to all of our questions. That's that's what we believe as, as a monotheistic Christian faith. In this culture that John is living in, in this culture, it's not monotheistic. It's all kinds of gods. They had a God for the kitchen, they had a God for the garden. They had a God for, the, for their business. They had a gods for everything. And if they wanted their garden to do well, they would have to pay homage to that God. If they wanted the kitchen and the food to taste good, they would have to pay homage to that God. If they wanted a career to do well, they would have to pursue that God and then pay homage to that God. Now, before you think that's crazy or like how would people do it, no, we do that in today's culture. In fact, we call them ideas or labels or beliefs or systems or, or maybe you call it Democrat, Republican, whatever you want to call it, there's these ways in which we get to power. There's these ways that we get purpose. There's these ways that we get to success. Let me draw it to you like this. John would say, 
in, in this culture, as he's describing it, he said, look, God's up here. And, and God is a God of purpose, and he gives us purpose. He's a God of purity, and he gives us purity. He forgives our sins. He's a, he's a God who gives pleasure, defines what pleasure is. He's a God that, has, that gives uh, possibilities. He does miracles in our lives, things that we couldn't do beyond ourselves. Provision, provision. Say, uh, pastor, so everything has to start with p-, p. All right, you with me on this one? Come on, give me a hand. That's a lot of P words right there. Come on. <laughs> and in this society, in this culture, and even in ours today, there's this idea that to get to God, to get these things, we got to pursue we got to pay homage. Now, it's like this. I, I like sports. You play sports. I like sports. Um, if you're on a sports team, let's say there's one guy on the sports t- team, and he's like, look, guys, we've won the last five games, and I haven't washed my socks at all. And I really think that because I didn't wash my socks, we won the... Now, you, you laugh at this, but in sports, there's a lot of superstition, a lot. And so he might go to the rest of the team and say, guys, we want to win this championship or not? We're not going to wash our socks. Let's all not wash our socks. If we all not wash our socks, we're going to win the championship. It's going to be awesome, right? And so maybe the whole team's like, yeah, we're not washing our socks. We're not washing our socks. This is going to be awesome. We're going to win. And trust me, you, you watch the Final Four, they, they had to eat at Benihana every time that one team had to eat at Benihana before they played. The, this is a real thing, superstition. But what if there's one guy on the team or one girl on the team and, and, and they're like, no, nah, I don't really like foot fungus. I don't, I don't want really any of that, right? I, I, I'm going to clean my socks because it stinks in this locker room, and it's really bad, right? And, I, and they might go, I don't even believe what that belief that you have. That so-, like, They wouldn't be upset that he didn't believe it. What they'd be upset about is if the team lost. Then the whole team comes back to them and goes, why don't you, why'd you wash your socks? See, in this culture, it's okay for you to have different beliefs and different ideas and different things as long as your beliefs doesn't hinder their beliefs. So if Christians were deeply persecuted in this time because, you know, they had a, a God for everything. And we believe actually it's only one God, Jesus Christ, that he's the only way. Jesus Christ, he's the, word, he's the bridge to all those things that you want. He's the only path to that. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through me. And in this culture, in this culture, what they, you can call all kinds of things that you want, but it's like this ladder, this pursuit, this pursuit of God. And you can call it religion. That's what religion is. I got to do all the right things and don't do the wrong things. And if I do the wrong things, I'm going to fall back down the ladder. Faith is a big deal for me. Where are you at in your faith? I ask that to a lot of people. And I, I don't, how, do you, how do you determine that? And, and a lot of times I ask that to people, like, where are you at in your faith? And they'll start going, well, you know, I go to church, especially when they have Donut Sunday. Um, I, uh, I, I, I try to read my Bible. I try to pray. Um, I try to do good. I try to be a good person. Uh, I gave a couple times. I texted. I gave. And, and, and I go, no, 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 no. That's religion the do's and the don'ts and that's all reli- that's not what th- this is what john says he says this in verse two this one who is life itself was revealed to us and we have seen him and now we testify and proclaim to you that that he is the one who is eternal life and he was with the father and then he was revealed to us we proclaim to you what we ourselves have actually seen and heard so that you may have everyone say it fellowship say fellowship yeah. So that you may have fellowship with us and our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. That word fellowship, koinonia, to be put together, to be knit together. It's this idea that that religion says we've got to pursue God. The religion says I've got to climb this ladder. I've got to do all these things. I've got to believe all these things. In culture, it says, this is what the label is. Well, this is how you got to live. Or this is what the political party is. Well, this is how you got to vote. This is, this, is, this is a way that we're going to get to purpose and power and purity and pleasure and possibility. But John says, no, 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 no. You, you, you got it wrong. He says, this is you. Yeah, yeah, this is you. And God is perfect in purpose and power and purity. And yes, he revealed himself to us, meaning, meaning
meaning God himself put on human clothing in Jesus Christ, and we put ourselves in Christ, in Jesus. Uh, John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, Jesus Christ, and that whoever would trust him, believe in him for purpose, and believe in him for purity, and believe in him for possibilities and, and, and power, and believe in him for pleasure, and believe in him for possibilities in their life. If anybody would trust him, put their life only in him, will have eternal life, will have a relationship A relationship with Jesus Christ. It's koinonia, he says. It's a fellowship. And our koinonia, our fellowship, this church is all based on trusting Jesus for all these things in our life. And you, you come to life, and life creates pain. And life creates suffering. And, and, and life creates questions that need answers and if, if you just had one place where you could come and get some straight answers and John says this is it listen he says this we are writing these things verse 4 so that here's his purpose so that you may fully share our joy joy and John writes in Greek so that joy word is not just happiness it's it's kara now everybody's going to name their daughter Kara. Kara, meaning the pursuit is complete. When the pursuit is complete, so that you may share a completion to your pursuit. A completion to your pursuit. Would, yeah, I'd call that joy. We pursue all kinds of things in our life. I do too. We pursue significance. We pursue a good family, a happy family. We pursue happiness. We pursue connection with other people. I was telling somebody, you know, as we're starting these churches around, you know, we have three in Indy that we're starting, and we started one in, in Muncie, and now we're starting the one in Pendleton. One of the things that we have been learning is that there's this great poverty and in some places, it's financial poverty. We see that in, in Indy and in Muncie and in, in Madison County. But, but, but in Hamilton County, there's a poverty of relationship. A poverty of It's hard to make friends here. I, last week, uh, Pastor Byrne invited me to go to the YMCA prayer breakfast where uh, Frank Wright, the head coach of the Colts, uh, gave an incredible sermon. I mean, it was just amazing. And I got to sit right next to the uh, school superintendent for Westfield Schools, and we hope to start a church in Westfield. And so I got to sit next to her and, and just kind of learn about the community a little bit more and, and what they're projecting and, and what God is doing, there, you know. And, and, and she had her daughter with her, and her daughter was like in her, you know, mid-20s. And, and I said, can I, can I ask you a question? She said, yeah. I said, uh, you've only lived in the community for a few years. I said, isn't it hard to make friends here? And she was like, yes. And then she goes, I told you, mom. You know what I mean? Like, it's so, there's this poverty. And, and there's this completion of a pursuit. John says, I want to share that with you. Because you're chasing so many bridges to nowhere. But this is what we all want. And he said, listen, I want it too. And I've stood eyeball to eyeball, shoulder to shoulder with Jesus. And he revealed himself to me. He showed me who he was. He's God. He is the word of life. He's the beginning. And he's the never ending. So where are you at in your faith? I put this little thing on your chair it's called a spiritual journey guy. Would you pull that out for a minute? My friend Gary made this, and he showed it to me uh, years ago. 
And it was so eye-opening to me. It was so life-giving to me. And here's why. Because when I ask people, where are you at in your faith? Right away, they're going to go through all the bridges and all the religion and all these things. And I kind of have to cut them off. Like, take time out, time out. I'm not talking about religion and do's and don'ts and, and did you check in on Facebook at your church. I'm not talking about that. I, I'm, talking about, I'm, I'm talking about a relationship between you and the big man upstairs. Like, where are you at in that relationship? And if you're like me years ago, I had no idea how to describe that or what that meant or where even I was at until Gary showed me this thing. Take a look at it. Find a bunch of bullet points on there. When you can show people where, you're, where they're at, well, then the next question I have is, where would you like to be? I'm talking to the curious right now. You're not convinced about Jesus. No. The curious are in the room because someone invited them and they said there's going to be donuts there. And you were like, yeah, I'll come and you better give me a donut, right? And then you found out there's donut holes here and you're like, all right, this was totally worth it. This is awesome. This is great. And so you're here right now because you have a friend. You care about somebody. But you're here and you're maybe curious. Like you've heard this whole Jesus thing. You're looking around. You're going, I don't even know if I believe. Perfect. Perfect. This series is for you. My goal is to remove obstacles and distractions so that you can take next steps in your spiritual journey. Like, wouldn't it be nice if you're curious? Wouldn't it be nice if you could just come to a conclusion on this Jesus thing? If Jesus isn't real for you, we'll figure that out together. Just come to a conclusion on it. We're done. I came to a conclusion on it. Over the next four weeks, I want you to bring people who are curious. Maybe they're going, I don't know if I, this is the perfect series for you to bring them to. We want them to ask the hard questions. We want to answer the hard questions. We're going to look at John because John is saying, look, you need some straight answers. Let me tell you how it is. Some straight answers to life's really difficult questions. Maybe you're convinced. You're here and you're like, John, I know church. I know what the big numbers are to the little numbers. I know all the symbols. I know all that kind of stuff. But listen to me. Sometimes we become convinced and we become calloused. And so what I want from this series is we answer these questions. It reminds you of the first love of Jesus Christ. It reminds you and you experience God in a way you never thought possible again. That you would experience life again in Jesus Christ. A renewing and a refreshing, a making new of your faith over and over and over again. And we as a church, this is our chance. Listen. I love reading the news. I love history. And there's no better time than Waterline Church right now in culture. Culture. I'm not talking about cultural Christians where we're all fans of Jesus and we got the bumper sticker. I'm saying we're followers of Christ. What does that mean for us? How do we love the hell out of this community? How do we love them so much by the way we love one another that the idea of Jesus is attractive And the church is not a stiff arm, but the church is an embrace to them. That everybody feels safe and everybody feels welcome and everybody knows this is a place to be loved and to feel loved and to know that you're loved and a place, a launching pad for love because love never fails. That's who we are as a church. What would that look like? We're not the first to be at this place, by the way. I'm so glad that the Holy Spirit came alongside John and he gave us 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. I'm so glad. It's a miracle in itself how these documents made it to you today. It was his Hail Mary from that prison cell on Patmos. He said, I got to get this to them. So he says, I proclaim to you. He's the word of life. Would you stand with me? So where are you at in your faith? Where would you like to be? My role as your pastor is to remove the obstacles and distractions to, to attempt to answer the questions that are, are standing in your way to pursuing, to a completion of the pursuit so that you could share in the fellowship but you could share in the full joy of having Christ in your life, daily providing and giving these things right here. 
Where are you at? If, if you're the curious today and you say, I'm curious about this, welcome. I am so pumped that you are here. If you're the convinced, I say, this is going to be a new day for you, okay? This is going to be you experiencing God in a whole fresh way. And Waterline Church, as your pastor, I want to equip you and empower you and encourage you over the next five weeks to love this community in ways we never thought possible before. To really be the church that Christ calls us to be. That's who we are. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this opportunity today just to introduce your word to people, to just to introduce your apostle John to some people and to, to read your word, God. And I ask, Lord, that as we read those words, that, that there was something in our soul that the Holy Spirit stirred up, that there was something deep within us, God, that we deeply desire to know you, to experience you, to come to a conclusion on this, and to be your church in this culture, in today's world. Lord, we love you, we praise you, we glorify you. We want to be on mission with you, God. We want to be the initiators, the catalysts of your kingdom expansion. God, we give you this series, we give you this teaching, and again, God, we give you ourselves. We love you and praise you. In Jesus' name, we all said, amen. Let's sing.